Good afternoon, everyone. I know everyone has been anticipating this video, and I put out the preview video on Wednesday saying that this is what I was going to be discussing this week. And if you watch the video on Wednesday, you know this is about the history of the Democratic and Republican parties. Now, a lot of people might think that the Democratic and Republican parties have remained unchanged throughout the history of their existence in American politics, but that is actually not true. They've gone through a series of changes, um, ideological shifts, um, and the, the party that existed in 1792, which was the beginning of both of the parties, is not the same party that it was today. So we're going to start, of course, in 1792, and then we're going to work our way up to the current recent most the recent era and we're going to examine a couple of the major situations in the parties and their shifts and their ideological shifts that basically contributed to what we see today in politics in the united states so as i mentioned the parties began um came into existence in 1792 and the party was founded by um, thomas jefferson and james madison and it was one party um the democratic republican party and uh, they basically were created as a opposition party to the to the Federalist Party that was led by George Washington and Alexander Hamilton. Um, one of the some of the key points that people probably would find surprising about the the newly created Democratic Republican Party of 1792 was that they opposed the Constitution because they believed that it would create a monarchical rule, meaning, and that was important at that time, because the United States had fought a revolution you know, to distance himself from England and the British crown. And they felt that the constitution would create somewhat of a monarchical rule. And they believed that the constitution was anti-Republican as the idea of um, Republicanism and, and that was taking shape in the United States. And this idea that the, the government was a representative of the people and not the other way around was um, a key part in what they believed they needed to establish, which is why they stood against the um, um, constitution. One of the key people that was very also pivotal in this time was Thomas Paine. And if you look in a lot of the Thomas Paine right now, I would recommend that you get um, familiar with Thomas Paine because he, he basically was part of the reason why the Democratic Party, the Democratic Republican Party shaped and they formed. They were the anti-federalist party at the time. And also they called themselves Republicans. And that's one of the, like, the, 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 I guess, interesting facts back then is that we all were Republicans. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just realized this when I watched the video today that I completely forgot the part where I actually explained when the parties actually split. And actually what is missing is the Democrat uh, explaining the, what, how the Democratic Party became the party that it was or how the Democratic Party, what the Democratic Party believed when it first decided to split. And I was looking at the video and I noticed that it just goes straight into the Republican Party. Um, so I'm going to do that today. I'm going to insert this in the video and I'm going to re-upload it. Um, so yeah, the Democratic Republican Party, which was the unified party with the Democrats and the Republicans, split in 1824. If you remember in the previous um, slides, I said that the party formed in 1792. Um, and the Democratic Party, you know, were led by Andrew Jackson, and they were spearheaded by the Jacksonian movement, the Jacksonian Democrats. Um, the party was socially conservative. They were the conservatives of the time. They believed in suffrage for white men. They believed in a strong um, government, a strong elect executive branch and president at the expense of Congress. You know, and that was one of the reasons why they why they split with the Republicans because of that stance right there. It's that they the Republicans were very very keen on having the Congress be powerful and the president not having too much power. So the Democrats were more keen at that time of having a strong executive instead of in a weak Congress. Um, both parties were still anti-federalists. They didn't believe they 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 really didn't. Um, um, really start coming around with the Constitution until in the later years, but they both were very, very um, um, anti-federalist, um, anti, you know, centralized government, you know, or whatever you want to believe. I don't think the Democrats were as, as anti at this time because they were calling for a strong executive at this time. Um, 
the Democratic Party split in like around 1860 and 1860 elections because the Northern Democrats supported um, Abraham Lincoln, while the Southern Democrats were supporting a man by the name of John Breckinridge. Now, this is also contributing to a lot, of, a lot of the Southern Democrats ended up becoming Republicans because a lot of the Republicans also had this strong, you know, idea that the government shouldn't be as powerful, and the Southern Democrats were were felt that the Democratic Party was not speak it to their experience anymore, so they decided to become Republicans. Now, the Republican Party, on the other hand, was the more progressive party. They believed um, more so in the idea of um, abolishing slavery. That was one of the main reasons why the party was founded, because they were founded by anti-slavery abolitionists um, and John Quincy Adams. Um, they largely dominated politics um, from 1860 to 1932. Um, they are originally described as the classical liberals. They believed in extreme economic reforms and began to shift towards conservatism also during the progressive era. And we'll discuss that also um, later on. Now, when I talk about the progressive era, I'm talking about the era in the country that occurred between 1890 and 1920. Now, if you know anything about American history, you know that this was around the time of the Great Depression. And these was also the first generation to after slavery. So we were dealing with a lot of, you know, serious issues in this country at that time. We were dealing with the first couple of generations after slavery had ended. We were dealing with sharecropping. We were dealing with the rise of the KKK in the Jim Crow South. So... Uh, what ended up happening as a result is a lot of these Southern Democrats and um, a lot of the ex-national Republicans um, were taking a more conservative stance on things. And they felt that the government was getting too involved in the lives of the people. Um, and this was their sort of laissez-faire mentality that, you know, this idea that the government can't fix everybody's problems and that the government needs to be more hands-off when it comes to the lives of the individual. So this is the shift that the Republican Party was taking. This was very, very um, attractive to a lot of the Southern Democrats in the South. And this was um, a lot of the reasons why you see now a lot of the s Southern states that were at the beginning of the um, the country's history were heavily Democrat after the and post Civil War were heavily Democratic states. That shift started happening around the 1920s and the 1930s, when a lot of these people and then all the way up until the 1940s actually, um, because a lot of the sucks the, the Dixie Crafts in the South ended up leaving the Democratic Party because the Democratic Party was taking a more progressive stance. Um, and I think what ended up cementing that shift was the New Deal from 19. 1933 to 1936 um, and we saw a lot of the you know ideals um, of the parties um, shifting towards more a of a concrete era where you see you know the new Republican Party taking shape that somewhat resembles the Republican Party that we see today now I want to um, um, expand upon a new deal um, um, argument and explain why you know this was a this was a uh, one of the pivotal points in the Democratic and Republican parties. The New Deal, um, as we know it, took place during the years of 1933 to 1936, and it was championed by Democratic President Franklin D. Roosevelt. Now, this primarily focused on a series of programs and public works projects, financial reforms, and regulations. Now, if you hear anything about regulations, um, if you look at the common, the, the, the current Republican Party, one of the things that they are very, very adamantly adamant that they oppose are any forms of regulations because they feel, again, that it impedes on the lives of the individual too much and individual businesses too much. Democrats championed these reforms because they felt that they needed to do more um, to assist, you know, and... Um, fixing the problems that they had had occurred during the previous gen the previous decades during the Great Depression, um, Republicans felt that the um, reforms were too far reaching and opposed them because they believed that the again that the reforms were involved in lives of individual citizens too much, and they wanted a more um, conservative solution. Now, they felt that the the New Deal was. They opposed the New Deal because of its huge cost, but they viewed it as a huge cost. And they felt that the taxpayers, a lot of this 
expense would be um, forced on the taxpayers. And they felt that it would be the disappearance of this laissez-faire type of um, government that they had become accustomed to. And I don't think we could talk about the New Deal era without talking about Barry Goldwater. Now, I... And, I, and no one else is calling him this, but I'm going to say it. I believe that he is the father of the modern Republican Party and this idea of, you know, hands off government and, you know, opposing, you know, unions and liberals and this idea of the liberal government that they did not want. I feel that in any kind of narrative that will lead to compromise on their conservative values. I feel that Barry Goldwater is the embodiment of that. And one of the things that you, and and, and I don't want this to be a video where it's like, oh, you know, Republicans did this and Democrats did that. I'm simply highlighting the things that I feel were the most significant and why we see politics the way they are today. Um, Barry Goldwater was one of the, um, very the most vocal advocates against the Civil Rights Act. Um, and if you listen to a lot of libertarian conservative commentators um, like Rand Paul, Ron Paul, and all these others, quote unquote, libertarian um, classical liberal types, they're very they're vehemently opposed to the Civil Rights Act. And Barry Goldwater was exactly that type of person. Again, this is the idea that the government shouldn't be involved in their lives, telling the individual citizens of how they should live their lives or believe. Um, he rejected the New Deal and any t sort of conservative um, compromise on it. Um, there was a conservative coalition that very, very that definitely supported the New Deal. I uh, um, initiatives and Barry was very vocal against them. Um, he ran a presidential campaign against Lyndon Johnson in 1964 and lost. Um, he opposed, he, again, he opposed New Deal liberalism because of the close ties to labor unions. He was very critical of Republican presidents that even remotely considered compromising with Democrats too much, namely Dwight D. Eisenhower. And he was in Congress until 1987. So he was originally elected to Congress in 1953 and served until 1987. And his seat went to, uh, his seat um, was um, being, he actually, let me just make this point right here. He was the first Republican to win the seat in Arizona. And his seat has been Republican for a very, a very, very long time. Um, and he was replaced by John McCain in 1987. Um, Democrat has that seat now. So I guess it goes back. It's this pendulum is going back in the other direction. Now, the other person that I would probably, feed, the other, I guess, era, um, and I guess individual that I would think has contributed to the way politics are today would be Newt Gingrich. I feel that Newt Gingrich is probably the one that cemented um, the way the Republican Party thinks about compromise or even how they think of liberals today. Um, he was very vocal. He, he founded this group of young conservatives um, that were newly elected to Congress. Um, and he named it the Conservative Opportunity Society. And this was founded in 1983. And their sole purpose was to promote conservative ideas and any, any sort, of, sort of compromise on those ideals was viewed as a no-no, really. So any sort of... Um, mediation um, with the other side was talked down, was looked down upon. Now, this was the 104th Congress. Um, and I believe that this is the reason, this is the, I guess, the, the one point where we can truly say that this is the, the, the last nail that made the Republicans and Democrats these you know, forces backing, force, uh, bumping heads with each other from throughout history. Now, Newt Gingrich, he passed a lot of different things during this um, time because he felt that because of his contract with America, and you have to also include the Reagan 11th Amendment in that also, um, right? Because in this amendment, it basically tells Republicans that they shouldn't criticize other Republicans. Um, he passed the Fiscal Responsibility Act 
um, he uh, was basically the balanced budget act that people always talk about. He passed the Take Take Our Streets Back Act, um, which you know it, it, he wanted to pass these different acts. A lot of these acts he didn't really pass, but he fought to pass them. A lot of them didn't pass. He wanted to pass the Personal Responsibility Act, the laissez fair government government not involved in the lives of the individual too much the american dream Restor restoration act this idea that we're missing something you know we see this today and make america great again you know and they were very 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 adamant that you know bill clinton should not be trusted at any time and uh during newt gingrich's term and as speaker he shut the government down twice because he because of bill clinton uh moved his seat on the plane to the back of the plane you know, and I think that this this pivotal point where we are right now is I think that situation in itself was where we started seeing this idea of holding the government hostage to get what you want. And you don't see Democrats do it. And I made this point before. Democrats don't hold the government hostage when it comes to, you know, getting what they want. They typically want to come to a, you know an agreement on it. Now, one of the things I should also point out is that I think people get caught up in this whole idea of parties. And they, they look at the R, they look for the R's and the D's, but they, they don't understand that there is a, a philosophy that goes with those parties um, that determines the direction that the party is going to take. As you have seen, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party are nothing like they were from the beginning. The Democrats were the conservatives and the Republicans were the liberals. The Democrats were more willing to stick with the status quo and the Republicans were more willing to buck the status quo in the beginning. Um, at some point in the, in the party's history in the early 1800s, we see that the parties flipped. The conservatives were Republicans now because the Republican Party had adopted a more conservative value for them that focused more on individual responsibility and the government being minimize. Whereas with the Democrats, the Democrats took a role, uh, a more active role. They wanted the government to be more active in the lives of the individual to ensure that there were no abuses of individuals. You know, so it's really more than just, you know, a, pol a party thing. It's an ideological thing. And I think people need to um, really, I want to do a video on those, on that, on that particular subject of the differences between the ideological shifts and the Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal um, philosophies. Um, I would like to do more insight in those um, eras, um, areas, areas, yeah, areas. Um, but yeah, just basically um, understand that, you know, I'm not trying to bash anyone. I'm not trying to bash one party. I think that both parties have contributed to the country greatly. Um, I also think that both parties have done their fair share of damage to the country. And I think that we as a country need to realize, and one of the things I, I realized with this video is that the Democratic and Republican parties are like twins that were separated at birth. And one year they're into this, the next year they're not into that. And they go back and forth and they hate each other, but they love each other because they're exactly the same. And we need to all think about that when we move forward, um, going forward in this country. We, can't, we need to stop doing the whole thing of my party is more patriotic than yours because I served in the military and I'm a Democrat and I'm a liberal. I served alongside conservatives that were in the military um, and they were, Dem they were Republicans. And we all fought for this country the same way. And a lot of us died for this country. You know, our blood ble bleeds the same for this country. You know, I might be anti -cer certain things, but I'm definitely not anti-Republican. So have a great day, guys. Simplify.